Sometimes, the last place you look for a monster is the first place he strikes. University, an oasis of learning and personal discovery. And the perfect place for a predator. By the time you see him, it's too late. Very egotistical, self-centered individual. He was very intelligent, he was very cunning. However, he's not safe to be in the community. We have no idea who he is, we have no idea where he's from. In true crime, Investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. A frat house on the edge of a university campus. Halifax, Nova Scotia, 1998. I was on call that night for major crime. Shortly after 7 a.m., I got called to my residence to come in, and I went directly to the scene. The information I had was a, uh, I believe, a serious sexual assault. The victim, 19-year-old Janet Piercy, has been taken to hospital. The room suggests a violent struggle. My thought when I looked in the room, this person lives at this address. Uh, therefore, this is an attack that took place in his home. To me, as an investigator, that tells me that that is a high-risk situation for the offender. It's just screaming out, this is not my first time. Detective Martin interviews Dave Murphy, a student who actually witnessed the assault. He says he was woken around 4 a.m. by screams. He rushed downstairs and saw his friend, Ian Green, struggling with a young woman. Green assured him that it was just a quarrel, nothing to worry about. He started back to bed when it suddenly hit him. This woman was in trouble. Green fled the room. Green! Call 911, somebody! Nobody's seen him since. Murphy says Green is a good friend of his and a brilliant pre-med student. Everybody likes him. He has a girlfriend whom he treats with kid gloves. Murphy can't believe that this is the same person he saw commit such a brutal attack. To attack somebody is one thing. To go to such a high risk level of attack well, it's either somebody that's out of control or somebody who has progressed so far that it's not a big deal to them anymore. Either way, it's a very dangerous situation for, for citizens and for people in the area. Green has vanished. Detective Martin puts out an all-points bulletin. And he puts Green's girlfriend's house under surveillance. Then he pays a visit to the victim, Janet Piercy, to get her side of the story. She tells the detective how she met Green that night for the first time at the frat party. He was charming and easy to talk to. She felt he was a really nice guy. When the party broke up, he invited her to another party upstairs. There was no party. Green had other plans, but she wasn't interested, and when she went to use his phone to call a cab, he suddenly turned on her. When she tried to get away, he became even more enraged. She surely would have killed her if that one guy had not come to her rescue. Late that afternoon, the surveillance of the girlfriend's house pays off.
Green is arrested and brought into custody for questioning. During the interview, Green is calm. Very, very intelligent. When he was confronted with, you know, there are witnesses that saw you beat this woman in the hallway, he would just completely ignore it. He wouldn't acknowledge the fact that he was faced with this situation. He would clam up and not say anything. Um, however, as soon as you took him off topic, he started talking and never stopped. His favorite topic is himself. He is from Ross River in the Yukon Territories. His father died a few years ago in a motor vehicle accident, taking him to a junior A hockey game. So that was a very tragic event for him that he's still having difficulty coming to terms with. And his mother just recently died in a house fire. It's as a result of this that it's just so traumatic to him that he has to geographically leave the area because it's too painful to stay there. But there is something about Green that nags at Martin. He had a very compelling story as far as uh, one that would gather sympathy or at the very least empathy. However, he's trying to pass himself off as 19 years of age and there's no way that this man I'm talking to is 19 years of age. He's charged with the, um, the assault that took place on the, the young woman in the frat house. He's held for court on those charges. Martin immediately sends Green's clothes to the lab for forensic analysis. That night, Martin gets a surprise. There are no police records of Green's parents' deaths. In fact, there are no records of them at all. If I could describe his lies, I'd describe them as having both feet planted firmly in midair. There's no substance to the stories that he tells. However, he's very convincing at it. He's extremely convincing at it. The following day, Martin obtains a search warrant for Green's room. We were looking for clothing and identifications belonging to the victim. I found this white plastic bag, and what came out of that was a purse and a, uh, a wallet. When I saw the wallet, I, I was very shocked. Martin had presumed that they belonged to the victim, Janet Piercy, but the ID is for a Tara McDonald. When I saw the name, I realized exactly who it was. The case of Tara McDonald is well known to the Halifax police. This February crime was a, a very, very vicious beating um, with a baseball bat uh, that took place in the middle of the day in a very busy city street. Tara McDonald was alone, working in a thrift shop. Her attacker walked in and savagely beat her for no apparent reason. Coma, was in hospital for a very prolonged period of time, had brain surgery, several metal plates had to be put into her head as a result of being beaten by a baseball bat. But after her recovery, a schizophrenic had confessed to the assault and was put in jail. In the same bag, Martin finds another piece of ID. This one for a Lucy Taylor, a woman Martin has never heard of. So what does Green have to do with Tara McDonald? And who is Lucy Taylor? Martin requisitions Ian Thor Green's student records, looking for any history of violence towards women. There are no records of any offenses. In fact, there is no Ian Thor Green registered at the university at all. After 72 hours, Martin has a man in custody who has brutally assaulted one woman and possibly more. A convincing liar who Martin fears is a serial offender. To me as an investigator, that scares me. Because what type of a creature am I dealing with here? Detective Tom Martin has Ian Thor Green in custody for the violent assault on Janet Piercy. But he's sure there is more to Green's past than he is letting on. Martin calls Lucy Taylor, 
the woman whose ID he found in Green's room. He wants to find out how Lucy knows Green and why he had her purse in his room. Lucy tells the detective she has never heard of Ian Thor Green. But she was violently attacked after leaving a bar five weeks ago. She was knocked down from behind in the parking lot by a complete stranger. While she was lying helpless on the ground, he masturbated on her. He fled when some people scared him off. Martin thinks Green is responsible for all three attacks on the women, but he needs proof. He goes back to the frat house to talk to Green's friends and find out more about Green's personality and, most importantly, his relationships with women. His friends told me that he categorized women in one of two ways. Either they were like angels or they were trash. And the ones that he dated, where he was a perfect gentleman, these are the women that he categorized as the angels. And the trashy ones are the women who went to bars, the women who wore the skimpy clothing or who danced in a certain way. Martin requests the security camera tape from the bar the night Lucy Taylor was attacked. The officers who investigated Lucy's case saw nothing unusual on the tape. But when Martin views it, he identifies Green leaving just a few moments after Lucy. He notices something else. The jacket Green was wearing is the same one he had on the day of his arrest. Martin has Green's clothes tested again, this time for traces of Lucy Taylor. The results of the DNA tests are good news. The jacket shows traces of Lucy's blood. But there's more. Even though five months have passed since Tara McDonald was viciously attacked with a baseball bat, her blood has been found on Green's pants. Martin has irrefutable evidence that the creature he has caught is a serial offender. But Ian Thor Green still refuses to answer any questions about why he attacked the women. Martin turns for help to forensic psychiatrist Peter Collins. These people will lie and will deceive others and think nothing of it. They divide the world as to those people who they feel they can take advantage of. And if they're taken advantage of, it's their own fault. So they can rationalize and justify their victimizations of others and um, really don't feel any empathy for victims and can continue on. If Green did not care about his victims, why did he keep their purses and IDs? More than likely, he kept the purses as souvenirs. And most often than not, these souvenirs are used as masturbatory aids, part of their deviant fantasy when they think back to what they did to the victims. Colin's conclusion after examining Green's case is chilling. He's a psychopath, a typical psychopath, who unfortunately also was sexually deviant. The combination of psychopathy and sexual deviance is a, is a lethal combination. Martin posts photographs of Green throughout Halifax, hoping to hear from anyone who's had encounters with him. He gets a call from an unlikely source. A Catholic priest tells Martin he recognizes the photo of Green. Two years ago, this man came to his church asking for financial help. He said he was a medical student who had fallen on hard times. The church repeatedly helped this young man over a period of two years. But the priest knows the young man as Corey Callahan. Martin is completely at a loss. He collects Green's mail from the frat house and discovers he has not only one alias, but many. We have no idea who he is. We have no idea where he's from. How are we going to identify this guy? Fingerprints aren't doing it. Pictures aren't doing it. Military was checked. Uh, Interpol was checked. Um, FBI was checked. Everyone was checked. If come the end of the week, he still refuses to tell us, I'm going to have to put his picture on the media. 
and, and send it hopefully across the country and, and see if anyone can identify him. As the week passes, Green's photo is broadcast on the national news. It was late that night or in the early morning hours, and I got a phone call from our communication center saying there's a detective from upstate New York that wants to talk to you. His name is Frank Coney. He's recognized the photo as a man named William Shrubsall. Frank said, without question of a doubt, who you have there is William Chandler Shrubsall. He was a wanted felon who uh, skipped out on his trial back in 96 and hasn't been seen since. Coney tells Martin he'd better come down to Niagara Falls, New York. He's got a story to tell that's much stranger than fiction. July 1998. Detective Tom Martin travels to Niagara Falls, New York to meet investigator Frank Coney, who has identified Ian Thor Green as the escaped felon William Shrubsall. Martin is determined to gather all the evidence he can to put Shrubsall away as a dangerous offender. Coney tells Martin, William Shrubsall was an only child who had lost his father at a young age and had a domineering mother who doted on him. He was a bright student, chosen to be class valedictorian. He was a 17-year-old golden boy in love with his first girlfriend. There was only one problem. His mother didn't approve of girlfriends. She taught him that his reach should exceed his grasp and that he was destined for a better future than everyone else. Girlfriends would just get in the way. She always wanted the best out of him. I mean, he was highly educated. He was a valedictorian. And that's what she was looking forward to for the next day. On the night of June 25th, 1988, his mother wanted him to help her prepare the food for his graduation party. But Shrubsall wanted to go out with his girlfriend. His mother became enraged. She made threats to him that she was going to call the girlfriend, tell him to stay away from him, leave him alone. And that's when everything exploded. Who do you think you are? You're not going to call him. Police were called to the scene that night and found the body of Shrubsall's mother. Her face, you couldn't recognize her face. It was badly battered. There was a wooden baseball bat laying next to her, covered in blood. That was a horrible crime. I mean, that's your, your biological mother. I mean, that was his family. Within an hour, he did give a confession that he did assault his mother with the baseball bat, that she was always yelling at him, always on his back, and um, he just couldn't take it anymore. He showed no remorse. It didn't bother him at all. The girlfriend started crying, and he says, well, what's the big thing here? It's, this is no big thing. Coney tells Martin that Shrubsall was tried as an adult, and he was sentenced to 15 years for manslaughter. But his lawyer successfully appealed because of Shrubsall's age. It was reversed. They granted him youthful offender and he only ended up spending 16 months in jail, which was devastating to us. After he was released, Shrubsall went on to study at an Ivy League university, where he began a pattern of assaulting young women. But he was never charged. In 1996, Shrubsall returned home to Niagara Falls, where he was caught by police after he allegedly sodomized a 17-year-old girl. The day before his trial, he wrote his aunt a suicide note, saying that he was throwing himself into the falls. Within days, Shrubsall surfaced in Halifax and was reborn as Ian Thor Green. The brilliant pre-med student and psychopath who had found a new hunting ground.
Back in Halifax, Detective Martin contacts Shrubsall's three victims. Lucy Taylor, Janet Piercy, and Tara McDonald. He needs their testimonies to get Shrubsall declared a dangerous offender. They all banded together and they all, they all came through it. And it was the support and the cooperation and the desire to help that was amazing. It was the discovery in the first 24 hours of the investigation of Tara and Lucy's IDs in the same room where Janet Piercy was attacked that led Martin to retrace the predator's tracks, uncovering his true identity and monstrous history. In December 2001, Shrubsall is classified a dangerous offender, meaning life in prison with no chance of parole. This man is, in fact, a danger to society, will remain a danger to society, and has little, if any, outlook of not being a danger to society. But even behind bars, Shrubsall follows his late mother's advice, finding a way for his reach to exceed his grasp. A year after his conviction, Shrubsall changes his name once more, this time legally, to Simon Templer, the fictitious hero of the TV series, The Saint. He continues his life as a predator, hunting innocent young women in cyberspace. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. The names of the victims are fictitious. The names of the convicted are real. beginning of a horror novel by Stephen King. But this is real. Stalked by a madman in the night, a young man plays possum. He's disoriented. In the darkness, he runs for his life. He's afraid of what might be coming after him. He stumbles onto a busy highway. He's frantic. He wants the driver to call the police. It may already be too late. He's got two friends back there and the guy who attacked him is going to kill them. True crime, investigation, and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Manitoba, 1993. In a police car on a rural highway, a young man named Jason pleads for help. His friends, Lori and Jenna, are in danger. They might even be dead. Police take him seriously, but they need to hear the whole story from the beginning. Jason says earlier that evening, he and some friends had driven out of the city to party in the woods. He tells police the party started out great. Some weed, some laughs, a lot of beer. Eventually, nature called. His buddy, Stanley, followed him. They shared a joke. But then, lights out. When Jason came to, he was hogtied on the ground. He had no idea why Stanley did this to him. And he's terrified for his friends, Lori and Jenna. Jason's story convinces police to mount a search. Officers ask Jason for directions, but 
His head injury has made his memory fuzzy. The search goes on all night and into the morning. Stanley Pomfret, 31, is held pending multiple charges. The case is assigned to Detective Harvey McLeod. Certainly these young victims uh, went through something very horrific in the back of that vehicle. But to charge Stanley Pomfret, the detective needs detailed and consistent statements from the victims. All three streetwise teenagers live in foster care in the same Winnipeg neighborhood. Now I want to ask you a few questions. And... The detective is concerned that Lori and Jenna may be unwilling to talk about their experience. He asks the girls to take it one moment at a time. Lori says everything was cool at the party until Jason and Stanley went off somewhere. They were gone a long time. Jason? Jenna got worried. She went to find them. Lori says she waited. It seemed like forever. and Jenna don't want to relive what comes next. Mr. Pomfret subdues these young girls in the back of the vehicle by uh, tying them up into various positions. Uh, during this time frame, uh, various uh, sexual acts were performed on these young females by Mr. Pomfret, uh, of which he recorded them uh, via video camera and Polaroid film. Jenna says Pomfret told her, if you scream, I'll cut out your tongue and leave you to die in the woods. McLeod has heard enough. The girl's statement suggests to Detective McLeod that Stanley Pomfret planned the attacks well in advance. This crime scene was located in a, uh, a dense wooded area uh, between the east and westbound lanes of the number one highway. Now, can you imagine any, why anybody in the right mind, other than what Tomford had in his mind, would want to come here? I mean, secrecy, he, he was guaranteed secrecy. Nobody would ever venture into this area. Why would you? I mean, you can hear the traffic on the east side of the highway and on the west side of the highway. Uh, he knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, he had this well planned. In this secluded location, the detective notices that trees have been cut to make a hiding place for Pomfret's pickup truck. In the back of the truck, investigators discover a duffel bag containing Polaroid photographs of Lori and Jenna, and plastic bags of what appears to be pubic hair. Also, some earrings. Which, to our mind, looked like they had been forcefully removed from a person's earlobe. Uh, there was blood on the, one of the earrings and also on one of the studs to uh, keep the earring in place. Pending forensic analysis, Detective McLeod has all he needs to prosecute Stanley Pomfret for multiple premeditated sexual assaults. But as investigators prepare to leave the crime scene, a police dog finds something else.
A human skull. A second crime scene? Forensic investigators have discovered a human skull just a few feet away from the scene of a violent sexual assault. The original crime scene of which we have been notified about had now yielded another crime scene of much greater magnitude. Who died here? How they died is unknown. We assume that it was foul play uh, as we do in all of these matters and we treated it as a homicide. Scattered over a large area, Police find more human bones. We noticed that the uh, bones uh, uh, were devoid of any flesh or, or skin or uh, muscle material. Uh, uh, they were just uh, stripped clean. The detective knows why. Obviously, the body had been laying there for some time and had been ravaged by wild animals. There was a lot of uh, bear scrapes on the tree, a lot of bear markings, uh, hair, and uh, this was the original, originating point of, uh, of their meal right here. Aside from the human bones, the search yields nothing except some red paint chips. And then, a torn woman's shirt, an attack by bears, or a more sinister human predator. Detective McLeod sends the shirt to forensic textile expert Bill Pelton for analysis. I scan the fiber and yarn ends along the severance line. The fibers were all ending at the same plane, indicating that they were cut. And this meant that it had to be human intervention that could cause the damage and not an animal. The shirt has been deliberately cut. This confirms McLeod's suspicion of foul play, and so does the coroner's report on the cause of death. There were fracture marks in her skull that radiated from her left eye socket and above her left ear, uh, which indicated that she had been struck with a blunt instrument. Uh, her teeth displayed pink teeth syndrome, uh, which was indicative of uh, strangulation. Based on other bones found at the crime scene, the report concludes that the victim was a female between the ages of 15 and 17. In this one location, the murder of a young woman and a violent sexual assault. The two crimes could be completely unrelated, but Detective McLeod doesn't believe in coincidences. He confronts Stanley Pomfret with the ripped shirt found at the murder scene. He tells Pomfret that if he knows anything about the dead woman, now would be the best time to talk. Pomfret doesn't. The detective will have to solve this murder the hard way, working backwards from the time of death. Mother Nature provides the first clue. The next day, uh, we collected uh, various uh, samples of uh, larvae, pupae, and bugs that were in the area where the corpse had been deposited. And we sent them to Dr. Gail Anderson, uh, who's an entomologist at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. Insects are pretty much the first witnesses to the crime. They'll arrive very quickly after death, and they lay their eggs on that body. Eggs hatch into maggots, pupate, and emerge as adult flies living on the body for their entire life cycle. I had maggots, but I also had empty pupil cases, and those are the most important part of the evidence to me. Several pupae cases are in varying degrees of decomposition, indicating a precise number of days since death. My report to the lead investigators in this case was that death had occurred on or before the 5th of June. The murder took place just six weeks ago. Detective McLeod searches missing persons records. Reports from the beginning of June include one teenaged girl. The detective contacts forensic odontologist, Dr. Chris Lavelle. The RCMP brought me a skull and a lower jaw wrapped in separate bags and two dental x-rays of, of a child that they thought uh, was the victim. And I was then able to put them on a 
light tray for computer analysis and measured these teeth and the teeth outlines very carefully, looking at the positions of the tooth cusps and was able to confirm at least eight cardinal statistical similarities between the two. Now the murder victim has a name, Tanya Marshall, a girl who grew up in foster care in the same neighborhood as Jason, Lori, and Jenna. They tell McLeod they know Tanya, but haven't seen her in a few weeks. They are shocked to hear she's been murdered. The uh, lifestyle of the two young females who have been sexually assaulted and the lifestyle of the young uh, female who have been murdered uh, were identical. Uh, they knew the same people. Uh, they frequented the same areas. Uh, they went into the same establishments. The detective asks if Tanya had a boyfriend or a would-be boyfriend. Lori says she never talked about anyone. Tanya liked people to think she was tough. She was in foster care because her mother couldn't handle her. But the last time Lori saw Tanya, she was in a great mood. She'd met up with her mother and was planning to move back home for good. Lori and Jason have no idea who might have wanted to kill her. One young man remembers seeing Tanya on the day she disappeared, heading out of town in a red van. The detective wants to know if he saw who was driving. Sure, says the kid. Some guy named Stanley. In an interview room, Detective McLeod tells Pomfret he has an eyewitness who can put him with Tanya Marshall in a red van on the day she died. Pomfret isn't impressed. He admits he knew Tanya. He admits she was with him that day. But they weren't heading out of town. He was giving her a lift back home. They said a friendly goodbye, and that was the last time he saw her. The detective has sufficient evidence to convict Pomfret for the sexual assault of Lori and Jenna. But without a conviction for Tanya's murder, Pomfret will be out in three to five years. And he knows it. Detective McLeod lacks hard physical evidence to connect Stanley Pomfret to the murder of Tanya Marshall. He obtains a search warrant for Pomfret's property. Hidden under a tarp, the detective discovers Pomfret's other vehicle, a red van. Scrapings of its paint are sent for analysis to see whether they match the paint chips found in the woods. Investigators enter Pomfret's house and take it apart. We uncovered some pornographic literature and uh, pornographic films. The pornographic literature uh, showed instances where women were in bondage with various devices and also depicted the cutting of women with razor blades. It would give us a picture that uh, Mr. Pomfret was uh, of the uh, sexual sadist type of individual. Inside Pomfret's tackle box, an investigator discovers a medicine bottle with Tanya's name on it. The prescription pills were written for a 30-day period, and we examined the amount of pills in the bottle and extrapolated back as to when the, uh, the pills were issued to her. Uh, the last day that she would have taken a pill would have been on June the 5th, the day she disappeared. But Tanya could have left her pills in Pomfret's van the day he said he dropped her off. The next day, McLeod receives the forensic report on the paint scrapings from the red van. They are a perfect match with the paint chips found in the woods. Which proved to us that he had been at this uh, area several times in different vehicles. And this wasn't a haphazard area that he just drove to. But even this discovery doesn't prove that he drove Tanya here the day she disappeared. 
And then, a cloud receives some astonishing news. We had a DNA analysis done of the uh, blood on the earrings that we found in Pomfret's truck. The blue pickup truck where Pomfret assaulted Lori and Jenna. The blood on the earrings did not belong to either of the girls. It matched the DNA of Tanya Marshall. For Detective McLeod, the two separate crimes have just become one investigation. To prove Tanya's murder, the detective reviews the evidence of the assaults on the three other teenagers. The similarities are uncanny. And the common denominator uh, from all of this was Stanley Pomfret. McLeod now has a clearer picture of Pomfret and how he operated with the foster kids. He was like their cool older brother. He would buy them drugs, beer. He had wheels to get them out of town. They liked him because he was one of them, from a broken family with a long history of abuse. <laughs> Pomfret is Jekyll and Hyde, and no one, including Tanya, ever noticed. Pomfret would, uh, in my opinion, uh, prey on these young girls uh, to lure them into his confidence, uh, to make him seem that uh, he's Mr. Nice Guy. McLeod is sure that six weeks earlier, he used the same ploy on Tanya to get her into the woods. McLeod reconstructs what must have happened to Tanya Marshall based on Jenna, Lori, and Jason's accounts of what happened to them. It's an unusual way to argue a case, but for McLeod, it's the best he has. Pomfret clubbed Jason with a baseball bat, strangled him, hog-tied him, and left him to die. During the sexual assault of Jenna and Lori, Pomfret tied up the girls, cut their clothes off, assaulted them, and took some pubic hair as a trophy. Tanya's case is disturbingly similar. Like Lori and Jenna, Tanya's shirt was cut, Knots found in the shirt indicate it was used to tie her up. McLeod presumes that Pomfret sexually assaulted Tanya. When he was done, he strangled her, as he did to Jason, and then finished her off with a blow to the head. And finally, according to McLeod, Pomfret took a trophy, this time a pair of earrings. Each of these pieces of evidence by themselves uh, did not have any weight. But when you put them together globally, it's like a jigsaw puzzle that's totally unfolding before you, and all the pieces are now there. As McLeod completes the puzzle for the murder of Tanya Marshall, he comes to a chilling conclusion about the assaults of Lori, Jenna, and Jason. It certainly is to everyone's benefit that the young lad escaped his bonds, flagged down a car on the number one highway, and was able to raise the alarm. Uh, if he didn't do that, then certainly all three of these individuals would be dead today. The court agrees with Detective McLeod and sentences Stanley Pomfret to four life terms, one for each of his victims. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. The names of the victims are fictitious. The names of the convicted are real. in mysterious ways. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, April 17th, 1986. A devout man finishes his nightly prayers at synagogue. This isn't just any night. It's the first night of Passover, the holiday where Jews remember their liberation from slavery in ancient Egypt. But not everybody is celebrating tonight. 
Pittsburgh police get a tip. A gang of armed robbers is about to strike again. There's been a shooting in Squirrel Hill, Pittsburgh's affluent Jewish neighborhood. Caught on the trail of the robbers, they red ball it to the scene. I say it took us only approximately three to five minutes to get to this area. As I jumped out of the vehicle, I ran over to him and I asked what had happened. And he says, uh, he says, I'm shot. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Nearly 20 years after that fateful night, Constable Stagina can still remember the face of that frightened young man. He gave me his name at the scene. It was Neil Rosenblum, and he told me he was uh, a rabbinical student, and he was staying, living, I think, in Canada at the time. I try to make him comfortable. We try to cover him up because he was cold. He starts showing me his wounds at the time. I could see one in his wrist. And then and when I opened his coat, I could see blood in his shirt and around his chest area. I asked him what happened. Neil says he was on his way back from synagogue when a car drove up. The man in the passenger seat asked for directions. He said, uh, I said, I'd step off the curb to give him assistance. They just shot me. They shot me for no apparent reason. Neil describes his attackers. Two white men driving a black Corvette. Black Corvette? I says, uh, you sure it wasn't two black guys and two black females in a, in a dark hell of sedan? He says, no, it's definitely a black Corvette. Now, Stagina knows that the men who shot Neil Rosenblum are not the armed robbers he's looking for. He asks for a more detailed description of the shooter, but the paramedics need to get Neil to the hospital. He asked me, he said, am I going to die? At that time, I assured him that he was. And he then asked me while they were working on him if I would go get his wife. Neil's wife and her family have been waiting for him to begin the Passover celebration. Instead, they hear about the shooting. His wife was, was uh, she was beside herself. You could just tell me, you know, she just, uh, she couldn't believe that it happened. She was asking so many questions, and I, I couldn't answer them. You know what I mean? Why? What happened? You know, just all I could say was, you know, he was shot. We're still investigating. You know. Stagina offers to drive her to the hospital. But when they arrive, they hear the shocking news: Neil has died in surgery. Stagina never gets to ask him more questions. And Neil's wife never gets to say goodbye. The shooting of Neil Rosenblum is now a case of murder. Detective Ron Freeman takes charge at the scene. In the years since Neil's murder, he has worked on many other cases. Still, he remembers the details of this one right down to the caliber of the bullets. There were two 380 slugs, uh, uh, two 380 casings found at the scene, so we knew that the 380 had been used. The bullets and shell casings are sent to a firearms lab to trace them to a gun. Police start canvassing the homes and apartments near the crime scene, looking for a witness. We have several uh, several neighbors who heard what they thought were backfires, firecrackers. They eventually realized that they were uh, gunshots. And based on everything, a composite of what the police were able to tell us and the neighbors, none uh, saw anything. The streets were empty because of Passover. At the lab, the two bullets recovered from Neil's body are added to the 380s found at the scene. So what we had received were four full metal jacket bullets. Two, three, 
and also a copper jacket fragment. All of these bullets were uh, compared using the comparison microscope and found to be fired from the same firearm. The firearms examiner analyzes the unique marks on the bullets made by the barrel, the firing pin, and the breech face of the 380, and she compares them to other bullets they have on file. If she finds a match, this could give police a solid lead to the killer, but the bullets don't match anything in their files. So they were placed in what we call the open case file. And the open case file is a collection of bullets and cartridge cases uh, recovered from crime scenes where no gun has been recovered. Detective Freeman now turns to the family to see if they can help him find a motive for the shooting. He learns that Neil was 24 years old, studying to be a rabbi. Married for just over a year, he, his wife, and their baby daughter arrived in Pittsburgh earlier that day to spend Passover with his wife's parents. And all we learned uh, about him, that he was basically a very religious man and involved with his family very deeply. Abraham Kurtz knew Neil since they were children. He thought about other people, he, um, and he cared about other people. Their needs, you know, how to make things better f for his school, for his parents, for his wife, I mean, for wh whoever he met. He never did anything, said anything, and no harsh word ever came out of his mouth that you ever would have been in a fight with him. Clearly, Neil Rosenblum had no enemies. That leads Freeman to one conclusion. We could see no reason for him being shot other than the way he was dressed. I felt initially, as did everybody else, that this was a hate crime. This was an especially uh, difficult and, uh, case for us because the victim, again, was truly an innocent person. Neil's body is flown home to Toronto and buried according to Jewish law. His parents are devastated. The Jewish community is saddened by the random shooting and alarmed by the anti-Semitic overtones. In Pittsburgh, police move into high gear. The public is pressing for answers. You need to find who would walk around our city or drive around our city and just choose a citizen at random because of the way they're dressed and kill them. That's a serious situation. Police get thousands of calls pointing the finger at anti-Semitic groups and racist organizations. And we had to track all of those down because you don't know where it's going to lead. It just took us off in every direction imaginable. Amidst this flurry of time-consuming activity, police stay on their only solid leads, the 380 gun and the black Corvette. We started looking at every 380 that was registered in uh, Allegheny County, and then we tried to correlate that with anybody that had a Corvette and a 380. Police also pull over any Corvette seen driving in and around Pittsburgh. They work around the clock, but still they have nothing on the Corvette and no suspect from the anti-Semitic groups. It's as though some spirit has come and committed the crime. With a hate killer on the loose, are the streets of Pittsburgh safe? Is the murderer looking for targets, like Neil, who are wearing the distinctive clothing of Orthodox Jews? Nobody knows, and everybody's afraid. A year goes by, then two. Neil Rosenblum's family and friends commemorate the anniversary of his murder. A somber occasion made sadder by their belief that this was a senseless hate crime. They're not the only ones who remember. Although the case has ground to a halt, Pittsburgh police haven't given up. We were always aware of it, uh, always thinking about it, always talking about it in the office. And uh, then at some point, we got a call from an attorney, and the attorney told us about a client of his who had information on this case. By a strange coincidence, it's two years, almost to the day, since Neil's murder. The client's name is David Green, and he's serving time on a drug conviction. Since Green has been in prison, 
He's been sharing a cell with another guy who's also in on drug charges. First, he thought that would give them something in common. Pretty quickly, though, Green realizes that his cellmate was nothing like him. He saw the guy drawing a swastika. Then he started complaining to Green about the Jews. Eventually, he told Green that he hated Jews so much, he and his buddy Mike spotted one near a synagogue a few years back. They drove up to the rabbi and whacked him. That smoked him! Why is Green coming forward with this? Because he's afraid. His cellmate doesn't know that he's Jewish. If it gets out, he could be next on this guy's hit list. He wants police to move him to a new cell in exchange for his cooperation. But a convicted heroin user isn't the most credible informant. Freeman needs to verify Green's story. His first step is to check out his cellmate, Stephen Tilsch. We learned through other government agencies that were investigating him, uh, federal agencies and local agencies, that Stephen Tilsch was a, uh, uh, a mid-sized drug dealer in the outskirts of Pittsburgh. And then we looked at gun registrations everywhere, we, uh, every way we could with him, but as a convicted felon, he didn't have anything legally registered to him. So far, nothing corroborates Green's story until Freeman checks motor vehicle records. Turns out, Tilsch is the owner of a black Corvette. He got a speeding ticket days after Neil's murder. Police try to locate the car. No luck. The black Corvette has vanished into thin air. Police know from Green that Tilsch was with a buddy that night. They track him down. His name is Mike O'Grady, another known drug dealer. They pick up O'Grady on the street for questioning. He remembers that he was with Tilsch on the night in question. They were renovating a house near Squirrel Hill. When they were ready to knock off for the day, he admits they tanked up on booze and drugs, got in Tilsch's Corvette and started cruising the streets. Tilsch did have a gun, but he was only goofing around, taking pot shots at street signs and traffic lights, like he often did. As for shooting a rabbi, O'Grady says Tilsch would never do that. He's a bit wild, but not a killer. Detective Freeman believes that O'Grady's lying, but his hands are tied. He knew that uh, we couldn't force him to say anything, we couldn't force him to take a polygraph, we couldn't force him to do anything. But we thought, we're on the right track now, given time, we can flip him, we can convert him to our side. Once again, all Freeman can do is wait. He knows it's only a matter of time before O'Grady gets caught doing another drug deal. That's when he'll have the leverage to get the truth about Stephen Tilsch. But O'Grady keeps his nose clean. Three years go by. At the scene of another shooting for armed robbery, police recover a weapon. The gun is sent to the same firearms examiner who worked on the Rosenblum case. It's the kind of gun that you see in the movies, all the bad guys, all the drug lords and things like that. She compares the bullets from this gun to others on file. It's a routine check, but she finds a match, a match to the gun that killed Neil Rosenblum. The question is, can it be linked to Tilsch? There was no uh, manufacturer stamped into the frame of the uh, firearm, and there was no serial number on the firearm. This is no accident. The gun is homemade, put together by someone with criminal intent. Gun manufacturers found this loophole and they could send you a kit and it didn't have a serial number and there's no way to trace this. Freeman expected the murder weapon to crack open the case. Instead, another disappointment. But he's still clinging to one last ray of hope, that Mike O'Grady will talk. 
then, in a strange twist of events, Freeman is called to the scene of a car crash. The driver is seriously injured. It's Stephen Tilsch, recently released from jail and apparently, once again, out for a drunken joyride. The passenger is none other than Mike O'Grady. The accident has claimed his life. I mean, he was our, our link, and it was very frustrating because now he's dead. And every time we something positive developed, then there was something horrible that would jump up and stymie the investigation, and we couldn't go any further. Call it an act of God. Call it pure coincidence. Freeman's last hope is now crushed. After five long years, the case goes stone cold. But the detective won't let it go. Fifteen years after Neil's murder, his wife has remarried. His daughter has grown up without knowing her father. His parents still mourn the loss of their innocent son. Given the evidence so far, a drug-addled jailhouse snitch, an untraceable murder weapon, and the only eyewitness killed by the suspect himself, Hoping to crack the case has become an act of faith. Some cases you just cannot forget. Other cases you can. But there are some cases that homicide detectives just will not forget, and they will not let them go away. And this was one of them. After so many years, Freeman's faith is mysteriously rewarded. A new murder case lands on his plate. He's pretty sure the junkie who's been arrested knows more about this case than he's told police. And so we said, we know that you have information on a murder, thinking it was murder B. And he said, well, yes. And then he started talking about Tilch, murder A. Freeman cannot believe what he's hearing. It turns out that a few months ago, while buying drugs from Tilch, the junkie heard him brag about gunning down a Jew. It's the same story that Freeman had heard from the first informant, David Green. How Tilsch hated Jews, how he whacked the rabbi. And it was just one of those wonderful flukes. It was serendipitous how that came up and, uh, and it just fell into our lap. Freeman decides he now has enough to arrest Tilsch for murder. The DA decides to go for the max, murder one, premeditated murder. But Tilsch comes to court exuding confidence. According to his lawyer, the DA's case isn't strong enough to get a conviction. The prosecution has little physical evidence, and the two jailhouse snitches should be easy to discredit. The prosecution will have to present a very strong case. On the stand, Green describes what Stephen Tilsch told him about the murder. That night, Tilsch and his buddy, Mike O'Grady, went for a ride in the black Corvette. He let O'Grady drive because his license had been suspended. For a couple of months, Tilsch had been hassled by a Jewish federal attorney about his drug dealing. Tilsch was out for blood, and that night he steered O'Grady to the Jewish neighborhood. The bizarre circumstances leading to Neil's death are put together by Detective Freeman. Neil was alone, walking the few blocks to his in-laws. The Passover service had just ended. Had the service lasted another three minutes, they would never have met. Uh, had it ended three minutes earlier, they probably would never have met. Hey, buddy. Buddy. But they did hey, meet. The, uh... Tilsch was armed with a fully loaded, untraceable gun. He lured Neil to his car and then he shot him four times. All actions that speak of deliberate intent. 
And because God works in mysterious ways, Neil remained conscious just long enough to give police the crucial clue which led to solving his own murder 13 years later. Two white men in a black Corvette. A jury turns down murder one, but convicts Stephen Tilsch of third degree murder and sentences him to the max. 20 years for the death of Neil Rosenblum. Getting a conviction is a victory for Detective Freeman, who fought so long to solve this vicious crime. One's out looking to commit a hate crime, and the other is practicing peace and love and harmony. And uh, here we lost a wonderful, uh, compassionate person to uh, uh, one who hates. After 13 long years, Neil Rosenblum's parents can finally put their ordeal behind them. They had an affectionate nickname for their son, Nuti Shalom. May peace go with you, Nuti. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. The names of the victims are fictitious. The names of the convicted are real. When a man lives his life behind a mask and suddenly strips it away, what will he reveal? A massage parlor veteran, satisfying her lonely clients. But she's about to get one repeat customer she'd hope never to see again. Police receive her frantic call. Officers respond at once, but they have no idea what they're walking into. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Winnipeg, 2002. An armed man is holding a hostage in a downtown massage parlor. He's shot at two police officers. The one who was hit has escaped. But his partner, blinded by flying glass, is trapped in a room near the would-be killer. <laughs> Incident commander Keith McCaskill is on the scene within minutes. My job at the time was to try to ensure the safety of everybody concerned, the hostages, the suspect, and the police officers. While McCaskill assesses the situation, the hostage taker calls police headquarters. He says his name is Michael. The communications officer keeps him talking. She knows it's vital not to break voice contact. Before he's able to leave headquarters for the scene, crisis negotiator John Ormondroyd is stopped in his tracks. I'm loading all the equipment onto our vehicle, and I get a call that uh, this guy is on the phone now with our communications center. He's, he's very insistent uh, that he wants to talk to a, a male police officer, and he wants to talk to them right now. The incident commander is out there, our emergency response team is out there, and we like to be all close together so we can pass on information to each other. So one of us being you know, a distance from the incident uh, does create problems. Isolated from the team, the negotiator has to stay at police headquarters where he's suddenly plugged into a conversation with the hostage taker. 
Well, his conversation was very disjointed. Uh, he was very agitated. He, he wasn't making a lot of sense. He was changing subjects from one second to the next. I think at the time I was very nervous about what was going to take place. Uh, you understand that, you know, if you do things wrong, you're going to agitate the person, and that may have consequences for the, the person that's being held hostage. So I sort of went through sort of a mental checklist of the things that I was going to say. Uh, but then you fall back on the methods that we use to, to try and uh, calm somebody down and bring them back to a place where you can uh, talk to them. Within the first five minutes of, of talking to Michael, I've asked him, how about we resolve this by putting the weapons down and walking out the door? but obviously wasn't too receptive to that. Michael seems to be unhinged. The potential for violence is increasing. From his incoherent, aggressive manner, police suspect he is on drugs. And that makes the situation even more dangerous for the hostage. And for the wounded officer still trapped near the gunman. Suddenly, Michael hands the phone over to the hostage. She says her name is Lindsay, and Michael is an ex-boyfriend. She has no idea why he's doing this. Lindsay confirms John Ormondroyd's greatest fear. She says Michael is going to kill her, then shoot himself. He's told her he's going to die in this room. And we see that a lot in negotiations where the person starts out on one track, but ultimately th the thought is uh, they're going to commit suicide. And this was sort of the worst case scenario that you'd always trained for, and now was here. Negotiator Ormondroid is desperate to get to the scene, but he can't simply put Lindsay on hold while he drives downtown. So he remains trapped in the communication center. Because of a different location John was in, uh, he had to get the information, share it verbally with a duty inspector who would telephone myself and explain what was going on. And this happened for a period of time. Well, I think after about, uh, about two hours, it, this is just getting too complicated, way, way too complicated. Just as Michael seems to be calming down, ready to talk some more, the line goes dead. I'm actually talking to a taker on a cell phone and their cell phone dies. The negotiator's position is now critical. No communication with the hostage taker means no chance to talk him down. No chance to find out what he wants. He's dead. And most important, no chance to negotiate a way to get Lindsay and the wounded officer out alive. At the scene, McCaskill has to make a decision. Sit tight or move in and at least rescue the officer. Once the emergency response unit secures the area around the trapped officer, McCaskill orders them to go. The ERU storms in. They meet no resistance. There's no gunfire, no movement from Michael and Lindsay in the next room. Just an ominous silence. Taking the opportunity to rush to the scene, the negotiator arrives at police barricades. Hostage negotiator and crisis commander are finally together. Without phone communication, how is Ormondroyd going to pick up negotiations with Michael before he carries out his threat to kill Lindsay and himself? After threatening to kill his hostage and himself, the hostage taker's cell phone has died, cutting the only link police have to the room inside. But crisis negotiator John Ormondroyd has prepared for this. He told the hostage what to do if they got cut off. But luckily we'd sort of made arrangements as to what to do if that happened. In an earlier conversation, Ormond Droid had instructed Lindsay to search for her previous client's cell phone, left behind with his clothes. 
she finds it. Hostage taker and police are back in voice contact. They know that as a negotiator, I'm the person that is the go-between between him and all these people that are outside with their uh, weapons and their camouflage and, and all this. What about letting her go? Shortly after I get there, he has really started to settle down now. And now we are in a position where the conversation isn't as disjointed anymore. The negotiator is finally getting through to Michael. The agreement is made that she can leave. Michael tells Lindsay to get dressed and get out. Releasing her is a sign of good faith on his part. But good faith for what end? He has demanded nothing. No drugs, no food, no money. Police need to figure out what Michael really wants. Once police confirm that Michael isn't using Lindsay to lure them into his line of fire, they lead her out to safety. She's let out. He still had uh, his weapons. We're, we still had no intention of, of going in there uh, as long as he's armed, because we don't want anybody else being hurt, including him. At police headquarters, Detective Jim Bletsky has been interviewing witnesses from the massage parlor for several hours, trying to get a fix on the hostage taker. Lindsay is brought in for questioning. She was obviously distraught. Um, she was very upset by what had happened. In spite of her condition, Lindsay is anxious to help Detective Bletsky. I start to just have a general conversation with her about her suspect. Uh, she had a uh, relationship with him for two or three weeks prior to this incident. Lindsay tells the detective that she broke a rule of her trade, never fall for a client. She did, and even took Michael home. One night, she revealed to Michael that she was clairvoyant. When he asked her what she saw in him, Lindsay studied his palm for a moment and said one word, banks. That word triggered an explosion in Michael. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Lindsay began to fear her new lover. Lindsay says she became really afraid when Michael started acting out bank robberies. She began to think he was crazy, using too many drugs. Within weeks, she'd had enough and broke up with him. It's a strange account. But right now, the detective has more immediate concerns. He needs to know the layout of the room Michael's holed up in, so police can figure how to take him down without any bloodshed. While Bletsky has been questioning Lindsay at police headquarters, the standoff continues at the massage parlor. Only now, Michael is starting to confide in Ormondroyd, claiming he's a legendary bank robber. At that point in time, he makes reference to a number of incidents that had happened, been happening in the, in the city of Winnipeg over the last few years. I immediately realized what he was talking about. I think I had to pull my, uh, my jaw up off the floor first. And uh, now I'm madly scrambling and, and writing notes saying, you know, you better get this information out right away just in case he is. Initially, there was some skepticism as to whether you know, maybe he's just read about it all in the newspaper, and he's wanting to, you know, fulfill a, an ego thing. And, and I was, he was almost caught in a, in a real quandary because there was part of me that wanted to uh, interrogate him and find out more about the incidents. But then there's the other part of me that realizes that as a negotiator, my job is to get this person out. If Michael is who he claims to be, a notorious and elusive robber who has held up banks and armored cars over a period of seven years. Then the police have dangerous work ahead. As part of the investigative team tracking the violent bandit as he pulled off one armed robbery after another, Detective Bletsky well knows the nature of his crimes. The 
suspect had started off doing bank robberies unarmed. He then progressed to arming himself um, with shotguns, handguns, and entering the banks, but not firing any shots. It eventually progressed to the point where the suspect would begin to fire at the guards um, and wanting to get in, in, into a gun battle. What we knew was our suspect was becoming more and more violent, and we knew that we had to do something to stop him before someone was killed. It's been seven years since his first holdup, and police have no clue as to the bank robber's identity. So far, he's committed 35 cleverly executed robberies, always working alone. Detective Bletsky doubts that this smart, disciplined loner could possibly be the same man as the coked-out hostage-taker. He asked Lindsay to tell him anything she might know about Michael's claims of having a wild career as an infamous bandit. She says he had described his bank holdups with an insider's knowledge. And she believes he wasn't just bragging when he said he'd moved on from robbing banks to the more challenging armored cars. Bletsky's heard enough. I made the conclusion at the time that he more than likely was our suspect and he was responsible and he was now holed up on the second floor. The standoff has lasted six hours. The negotiator has gradually won Michael's trust. I think between uh, midnight and one o'clock in the morning, he's, he's becoming a little more receptive. The conversation is becoming uh, more positive. Now I'm starting to get the feeling that I can talk to him about coming out. We all wanted to see it resolved. We wanted to be able to talk to this guy afterwards and find out, uh, you know, everything that he'd done. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, incentive to, to keep things going. At last, Ormondroid gets an indication that the impasse might break. He agrees that at, uh, at about 3.30 in the morning, he would dismantle his weapons and walk out. But an hour before the 3.30 deadline, without warning, Michael has another violent outburst. But no shots are fired. Once again, there is only an ominous silence. And at 3.30, nothing happens. Uh, we try calling him back, and there's no answer on the phone. Is Michael playing cat and mouse? Is he lying in wait for one last blazing shootout with police? Michael, a violent hostage taker, who claims to be a notorious armed bandit, has been holding police at bay for most of the night. And there's been no sign of surrender, only a deafening silence. We try calling him back, and uh, there's no answer on the phone. He's decided that he isn't going to talk to us again. Incident commander Keith McCaskill gives the order to take Michael down. After 11 hours of gunfire, threats, and danger, the ERU breaks in to find Michael motionless, asleep. He's taken without a struggle. It's been a flawless operation, but big questions remain. Surprisingly, Michael seems quite pleased to be in police custody. He appears eager to explain what lay behind his violent standoff and why he claims bragging rights to 35 armed robberies over the last seven years. At the time of his arrest, he was identified to us as Michael David Cernick. He was 32 years of age, essentially uh, educated, well-spoken, came from a good family, uh, just someone that uh, didn't fit into society, someone who uh, wanted to do other things other than jobs like yours or mine. Detective Bletsky is amazed that this character could be Winnipeg's most daring, legendary armed robber. He was much smaller, a much less imposing figure than uh, what his image would uh, have portrayed earlier. Bletsky listens as Michael Cernick openly explains how he first got into robbing banks. 
why he got started with the robberies is essentially for the adrenaline rush. It was never for the money. It was strictly for seeing if you can do it. There was one particular incident where I uh, observed a mother and a couple of young children with her. Right now! And saw the terror in their eyes and decided at that point that he would never put anyone through punishment like that again. As a result, Cernick began targeting armored cars. He felt it was more of a fair fight by going after armed people. Police officers are armed, security guards are armed. Cernick is clearly enjoying telling his story. To convince Detective Bletsky that his stories are true, he proudly shows him a scar he has from one of the shootouts with an armored car guard. It was a clean entrance and exit wound, narrowly missing his Achilles tendon, narrowly missing his ankle bone. Perfect and only spot probably on his, on his foot that he could have gotten shot and be able to walk away. Detective Bletsky comes to one conclusion. Michael Cernick is the notorious bandit who has eluded police for seven years. He was never a suspect. Um, of the thousands of names that we looked through, he was um, never looked at. He was never on our list at any point. To confirm his story, Bletsky has Cernick's DNA compared to blood found at the scene of the armored car robbery two years before. It's a match. But one question remains. If he successfully avoided capture for so long, why did Cernick seize a hostage and have such a public standoff with police? He explains he went to the massage parlor intending to kill Lindsay for breaking up with him. He knew he was a somebody, but she was treating him like he was a nobody. He would kill her and kill himself and go out in a blaze of glory. But police see a deeper motivation. This whole incident was about him having the opportunity to speak out uh, to the police, to let the police know who he was and what he had been doing over these years. He was cunning, daring, dangerous, and for seven years had outsmarted police. Now he needed police to acknowledge what a professional he was, to have escaped them for so long. He admired the police, craved their approval, and even admitted he had wanted to join the force. Joe's a cop. You're not a cop. You know, cop. And I think that's why he needed to talk to a, a male police officer, uh, just so that he could brag, I guess, for the lack of a better word, about what uh, had been going on. To continue living without anyone knowing who he really was had driven him crazy. Michael Cernick never went to trial. A hostage to his own demons, he freely confessed to 35 robberies. He had stripped away the mask that concealed his secret life and demanded that someone pay attention to him. He got what he wanted for 11 short hours. And then he was put away, out of sight, out of mind sentenced to 23 years in prison. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. The names of the victims are fictitious. The names of the convicted are real. Everyone keeps secrets, but no one better than Seagal Awad. Among her friends, secrets with surprising twists. Hidden from her husband, unspoken secrets of betrayal. Shared secrets of the heart about lovers and untold secrets between mother and daughter. But Seagal Awad learned one lesson too late. It's the secret that you don't tell anyone that can kill you. In 
true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Calgary, Alberta, 1992. A young Ethiopian woman has been murdered in her apartment. Detectives Nick Kiska and Wayne Lowinger arrive at the crime scene. A uniformed officer is speaking with the victim's husband. His name is Shakeb Mohammed. One hour ago, he discovered the body of his wife, Sagal Awad, in one of the bedrooms. She was kind of on her side, and uh, the face was uh, away from the doorway facing the wall. And uh, there was a uh, ligature, what appeared to be an electrical cord that had been tightly wrapped around her neck. Some of her braids are trapped beneath the cord. Beads are scattered on the carpet. It kind of indicates that uh, during the course of placing the ligature around the neck, there was a struggle. The cord has been ripped from a clock radio so violently that only a stub remains. There are scratch marks on her neck, blood on her mouth and nose. Seagal has been attacked violently, but there is no sign of sexual assault. Detective Kiska spots something strange on the floor. A small scrap of paper. Written on it is the victim's address. Aside from the murder scene, the rest of the apartment is tidy, undisturbed. It appears nothing has been stolen. We didn't find any indication that the apartment door had been forced, uh, leading us to the conclusion that either the door was open or that the victim, in fact, knew uh, the person. Kiska's partner, Detective Lowinger, questions Seagal's husband, who appears emotionless. We started to talk to the husband to try and gather information about uh, his wife and how the partic that particular day had gone so that we could begin to do our investigation. According to the husband, that morning Seagal prepared their daughter for daycare. He and Seagal usually attended half-day English classes together. But Seagal said she had a doctor's appointment so would not be going. He left at 8.15. He claims it was the last time he saw his wife alive. He had indicated to us that he had, had gone to school. He left school and he began to wander the downtown core. The husband's English class ended at noon, but he says he didn't return home until five, and that's when he found his wife's body and called police. Detective Lowinger is suspicious. He doesn't appear to be coming real clean about where he's been and what his activities are. So the red flags run up. He spent the whole afternoon alone, didn't talk to anyone. So he has no alibi and he shows no grief. Normally a husband would have some emotion. This man didn't show any, none, not a tear, nothing. Police bag the husband's clothes for forensic analysis, hoping to find traces of his wife's blood on them. Then they take him to the station for further questioning. A pathologist is called to the scene to help police fix a time of death. But the air conditioning has been on all day. It's enough of a factor to make it difficult to pinpoint an exact time. The only conclusion is that Seagal was killed in the afternoon. But the pathologist makes one important discovery. There was some bits of fleshy material in her fingernails. Seagal may have scratched her attacker. If so, the killer's DNA will be found under her nails. Police preserve the evidence and send the body for autopsy. The next day, detectives Kiska and Lowinger go door to door within the tight-knit Ethiopian community. They need to learn more about the life of Seagal and her husband. The best way to profile the husband, the victim, um, their relationship is to speak with people who they commonly associate with. News of the murder has spread through the community. People are shocked. 
but they offer little help to police. No one really knew the couple. Finally, the detectives get a break. They meet a cab driver named Samatar, who says he was a friend of Seagal's. He still can't believe she's dead. He tells detectives they met as students in the same English language class, and they often had coffee together. The detectives question him about the victim and her husband. He says theirs was an arranged marriage, as is the custom among many Ethiopians. But he's not sure how happy they were together. At the morgue, the autopsy is performed by Dr. John Butt. Well, the conclusion in this case was that she died as a result of asphyxia, and it was due to ligature strangulation. What about the flesh under her fingernails? It was her own flesh from her neck. This is not uncommon in a homicidal ligature strangulation. The victim is trying to slacken the, the device around her neck, so she tries to get her hands underneath it. It's a dead end. There's no biological evidence that can lead to Seagal's killer. Two days after the murder, the detectives return to Seagal's apartment to understand more about the victim's world. It appeared that he was living in the master bedroom and that she was occupying the secondary bedroom. We started to realize that the victim and her husband were almost living two separate lives within the same apartment. On the top shelf in Seagal's bedroom, police find a traveling bag. It's packed with her clothes, as if she were ready to leave on a trip. And under the clothes, a jewelry case, locked. We ultimately broke into the case, and uh, it was uh, kind of like opening Pandora's box. It contains a bundle of letters. Airmail letters that had been mailed from Rome, Italy, addressed to the, the victim. Although some of the letters were very current, none of them bore the address of where she lived. There was actually a different address on the envelopes. The letters are handwritten in Amharic, the language of Ethiopia. Police will have to get the letters translated. In the box, the detective also finds one single picture taken in Rome. It was a photograph depicting the, the victim, uh, an unidentified male, and uh, someone that uh, we, we were sure was uh, our cabbie. Why didn't Samatar the cabbie tell them about being with Seagal in Rome? Who is the other man in the picture? And what does the husband know about all this? Less than 48 hours ago, the lifeless body of Seagal Awad was discovered, sprawled across her bedroom floor. Police already have two suspects, Seagal's husband and a cab driver who may have been more than a friend to Seagal. Detective Kiska goes to the address written on the letters found in Seagal's closet. It's the home of Miriam Shaheen, a good friend of Seagal's. Why did the letters to the victim come here? She told us that her address was used by the victim and that uh, the letters were, uh, she characterized them as love letters from someone the victim was acquainted with back in Rome. Miriam has been covering for Seagal, who had an affair in Italy with a man named Mustafa Musa. Seagal met Mustafa in Rome, where she lived for a year while her husband was establishing residency in Canada. Miriam tells the detective that Seagal was madly in love with Mustafa. He had written her every week since she joined her husband in Calgary three months ago. The detective shows her the photo. Although she doesn't know the man in the sunglasses, Miriam identifies Mustafa as the man with the dreadlocks. Could Seagal's husband have found out about this love affair? Has Mustafa been here to see her? We made some inquiries with, with Canada Immigration, and we determined that no one under that name had uh, either made application for entry to Canada or had, in fact, arrived in Canada. Mustafa can't be of any help to police until they can find him in Italy. 
But Samatar, the cab driver, is going to have to answer some tough questions. He has lied to police about his relationship with Seagal. The photograph puts him in Rome with her. What other secrets is he keeping from police? We confronted him with the photo, and he just told us that that wasn't him. It was, it was someone that looked like him. The cabbie swears it's a coincidence. He's never been to Rome. He doesn't even know the two men in the picture. Kiska is not convinced. He demands to know where Samatar was the day of the murder. The cabbie can't believe he's a suspect. He was working that day. And besides, he would never have hurt Seagal. She was too precious to him. He reveals he was more than a friend. He was her confidant. Although he may not have used these words himself, it became apparent that he was uh, in love with, with the woman, but that those feelings weren't shared by her. So he was definitely in, in the suspect pool. Is it possible that frustrated love drove the cabbie to commit murder? While Detective Kiska leaves to check out Samatar's alibi, Detective Lowinger has been trying to confirm the husband's story. We tried to establish the husband's alibi. He told us he left the school, he walked a distance. It took him a certain period of time to do that. We did time that walk from point A to point B, and we weren't able to come up with the same kind of times he was, he was giving us. He says he stops for coffee at a coffee place. Um, no one remembers him there. We tried to establish the fact that he was actually at school that day and couldn't clearly determine that. We couldn't find any evidence to support what he was saying in any way, shape, or form. Only one part of the husband's story checks out. Seagal did have a doctor's appointment on the day she was murdered. Detective Kiska pays a visit to the clinic. The doctor is reluctant to discuss one of her patients, even with the police. But she lets Kiska read Seagal's file. He learns that Seagal was here for a checkup. She recently had an abortion. Did Seagal come alone to the clinic? No, she was with a man. And not her husband, she was with the cabbie. Once again, the detective confronts Samatar. The cabbie says Seagal swore him to secrecy about the abortion. But now that it's out in the open, Samatar tells the whole story. He started to tell us that she wasn't in love with her husband, that she was seeking something far better than, than uh, what she had at that particular time, and that her husband had no idea that she was pregnant. Samatar says she wanted to leave her husband and her loveless marriage, and having a child would tie her down. Kiska is confused. She was already tied down. She and her husband have a daughter, but the cabbie reveals that the daughter is not theirs. She's an orphan they brought to Canada to speed up their immigration claim. Kiska's beginning to believe the cabbie has been truthful all along. So he asks Samatar for a favor. He wants to attend the private reception following Seagal's funeral to meet any other friends and family. He thinks that people will speak more openly with Samatar at his side. Detective Lowinger remains outside watching who comes and goes. Only one person is missing, Seagal's husband. I wasn't sure up until the point he doesn't show up for the funeral. That lack of concern uh, on his part told me that I think this is the right guy. The detectives have two theories. Either the husband discovered that Seagal had an abortion against his wishes, or he found out about her affair with Mustafa and caught her leaving with her bags packed. Six days after Seagal's murder, the results of the forensic tests on the husband's clothes come in. Negative. No blood at all. Police have motive and opportunity, but no hard proof. Yet, they can't arrest the husband. The next day, Miriam calls the detective over to her apartment. She's been translating the letters he left with her. She's found something that Seagal kept secret, even from her. Seagal was already pregnant in Italy. Father of her child wasn't her husband. It was Mustafa. 
It was very apparent that the author of the letters was deeply in love with the victim, that he was uh, very excited about the fact that she was expecting uh, his child, and that they would ultimately uh, be together at, at some point in time. At Kiska's request, Miriam calls a phone number in Rome, found from Mustafa in one of the letters. Miriam is informed that Mustafa is not in Italy. He's in Canada, and has been for almost two weeks. It's been eight days since Sagal Awad was found murdered. Detective Kiska wants to speak with her lover, Mustafa, but he has no idea where he is, until he receives a surprising call from Toronto police. I was told that uh, they had attended a disturbance. Two male occupants of this particular residence were involved in some kind of a fight or altercation, that one of those uh, individuals is likely responsible for the death of a woman in Calgary. Kiska takes the very next flight to Toronto. At the police station, Kiska interviews one of the two men taken into custody. It's Mahmoud, Sagal's uncle, whom Kiska met at the funeral in Calgary. Mahmoud explains that Mustafa Musa came to stay with him two weeks ago. But during the past week, Mustafa has been saying strange things about Sagal. Last night, Mustafa said he might have killed her. Stunning news. It still didn't make him a killer, but I would say that we were uh, at least as much interested in, in him than we were in, in the husband. The detective finally meets face to face with Segal's secret lover, Mustafa Musa. He claims he has nothing to hide, although he admits he did enter the country with a false passport. He confirms he is the man in the photo taken in Rome. The other man in the sunglasses is a cousin. And yes, he did write the letters to Seagal. He loved her. But when Kiska asks about his confession to the uncle, Mustafa denies ever making one. The uncle is confused and emotionally upset. The interrogation lasted several hours. And then kind of during the course of that, introduced this piece of paper and said, whose writing is this? Kiska shows Mustafa the handwritten note found at the crime scene with the victim's address on it. He readily admitted that it was, it was his writing. So, I mean, that was very significant because it, it tied him directly to the, to the crime scene. But Mustafa swears he's never been to Calgary. Kiska thinks he's lying but has no hard evidence to the contrary. And of course, there were some big gaps because I couldn't provide him with the information as to how he got there, how he returned to Toronto, or any of those things. I think his parting words were, prove it. Kiska intends to prove it. He arrests Mustafa and flies him to Calgary. The arrest is big news. Police release a photo of the suspect in hopes that someone can place him in Calgary around the time of the murder. They get just one tip. And once again, it comes from the cabbie, Samatar. A friend of his recognized the picture of Mustafa in the newspaper. He met Mustafa on a flight from Toronto to Calgary on July 8th, two days before the murder. Mustafa had nowhere to stay, so the cabbie's friend offered him a bed. He was up very early, and uh, they were sitting around in the kitchen and he asked how he would find a particular address. It was the morning of July 10th, the day of the murder, and the address was Seagal's. With this revelation, police finally have the last piece of the puzzle. This is what police believe happened the afternoon of July 10th. Seagal was alone in the apartment after returning from her doctor's appointment. She had packed her belongings and was ready to leave her husband and her daughter. Then, a knock at the door. But Seagal wasn't expecting anyone. Least of all, Mustafa. I'm sure that he expected that she would abandon her marriage and that they would uh, kind of live happily ever after. But Seagal had no such plans. 
Mustafa expected her to be pregnant with his child and discovered she'd had an abortion. She had changed her mind. In a rage, he strangled her to death. He didn't notice that he had dropped his handwritten note, leaving behind a most crucial piece of evidence. It was this note and his love letters to Seagal, found in the first hours of the investigation, which led police to Mustafa. Seagal had many secrets, but she kept only one to herself. She wanted to start a new life, on her own terms, with no man to tie her down. And when that secret finally came out, it cost her her life. Mustafa Musa was found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. The names of the victims are fictitious. The names of the convicted are real.